as you see from your program, they have brought with them a selection of music that I would call nicely varied, but that really is an understatement, particularly as it applies to the first half of the program. We have Haydn's Lark Quartet, we have Beethoven's Serioso Quartet, and although they were written a scant 20 years apart from each other, they really occupy alternate musical universes, and I think the same, in a sense, can be said for Haydn and Beethoven, at least temperamentally, although they knew each other and they overlapped, and Beethoven even studied for a little while with Haydn in 1792 when he first came to Vienna. They really are very, very different kinds of personalities and very different kinds of composers, and this, of course, owes something to their native personalities, but also it owes, I think, quite a bit to the fact that they really grew up in different social paradigms. We always think of Beethoven as the prototype for the wild-eyed revolutionary composer, and he grew up during this anti-authoritarian wave that crashed over Europe around the turn of the 19th century. Haydn, by contrast, was about 40 years older than Beethoven, and he grew up in a time when if you wanted to be a successful composer, you learned how to adapt and how to um, express yourself in the rather stratified confines of polite court society. And so for 30 years before he wrote this piece we're about to hear, he wore the silk stockings and the brocaded livery and the powdered wig of the high-grade servant to the Esterhazy family. And for his last years, he lived in lavish isolation in northwest Hungary in a rather rural area where his patron, Prince Nicholas, had built this lavish establishment, this beautiful palace and this very elaborate musical establishment. And so he led this secure, comfortable, regular, productive life. And yet, I think also by the end of this period, he was feeling it was rather confining for him. And then in 1790, it all just collapsed around him. Uh, his patron, Prince Nikolaus, died suddenly, was replaced by the man's son, Prince Anton, who was a very different kind of a person. He was a military commander, did not like this music stuff very much, didn't really like art that much, wanted to save money, and so in the name of all of that, he fired off the musical staff and pensioned off Haydn. In certain ways, I think he was a man far ahead of his time. <laughs> in any event, you would think that uh, for Haydn at the age of 58, that this would be a traumatic moment in his life, but in fact, he was vigorous, he was ready for a change, and he wrote a letter to a friend in which he expressed that rather directly. He said, this bit of freedom, how sweet it tastes. I had a good prince, but at times I was forced to be dependent on base souls. I often sighed for release, and now I have it in some measure. And so he stretched out his wings, and he flew out of that gilded cage, and he landed in London. And his music had preceded him. He had never seen the ocean or the channel, but when he arrived, he was greeted with open arms and lionized and treated to the kind of celebrity and fame and fortune that he could only have dreamed of in Northwest Hungary. And of course, this piece we're about to hear was written just at the time when this appointment at Esterhazy was collapsing. And he wrote six quartets, but of those six, this is by far the most popular, and I think it owes its charismatic personality and its ingratiating quality, partly to the fact that it was written in the knowledge that he was free now, and also in the knowledge that it would serve as a kind of a string quartet ambassador to the London audience. And they loved it, and they called it The Lark, in honor of this rather avian tune, which we hear high in the first violin, hovering above this staccato, chirpy accompaniment. And they gave it a secondary subtitle. They called it The Hornpipe, in honor of the beginning of the last movement, which begins, as you will hear, it takes off like a shot, and it has this sense of a jaunty uh, English sailor's dance. And beyond that, if you don't know the piece, nothing more needs to be said. It is a completely accessible and delightful piece. A friend of mine, an annotator, once called it the four movements, a story, a song, a dance, and a party. 
and I think is a very good party indeed. And I'll be back at the end of uh, the party in about 20 minutes to tidy up a little bit and prepare you for Beethoven before he comes in to bust up the joint. So uh, anyway, enjoy the concert, enjoy the Jerusalem String Quartet.